Welcome back to The Pulse with Willie and Al. How's it going today, bro? Willie, living the dream, man. Living the dream. It's uh, it's pretty nice here in New Hampshire. Uh, it's starting to get warmer, which is nice, and uh, I'll take it. Yeah, man. I'm yeah. I'm actually, it's starting to heat up in Istanbul here, man. We're having some hot days, so uh, getting, some, getting some low 80s. You know, it's nice t-shirt weather, right? Yeah, no, I mean, we're here we're getting, uh, I think, maybe 50. So, like, I'll take it. Yeah, that's good. And, and you know me, that's 50 is enough for shorts weather. I mean, 20 degrees of shorts weather. So, yeah. it's all relative, really. You guys are still good for one more snowstorm before <laughs> before you're in summer. So. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, guys, we are back today. We're bringing you our 39th episode. Uh, We already recorded this episode, which is kind of funny, uh, but ran into a few problems. Uh, Some of you were probably wondering what happened and why we didn't release an episode for a few weeks, but uh, we ran into some sickness. We ran into some technological problems, uh, but now we are back. Uh, Like I had mentioned, we shot this 39th episode originally about three weeks ago. We filmed it. Uh, We recorded it. We did the damn thing. But it didn't record the video of us. And that's what you want to see, the moneymaker. So let's just say it's too good to be released. Is that okay, Al? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) All right. So, uh, but before we dive into this 39th episode, just go ahead and take two seconds. Make sure you smash that subscribe button. Go ahead and like that video uh, so that we can keep bringing you that NFL and MLB content that you love. All right? Better go and do that. So. Uh, As I mentioned, our last episode got cut off a little bit, uh, unable to hear our takes on the AFC and the NFC East and South. Uh, But don't worry, we're going to be bringing that back after the draft, which kind of makes sense because we're going to be rolling through that stuff after these guys, these players have been drafted. Take a look at the teams from that point. We'll also see some of the remaining free agents that are out there. Um, And those will be coming uh, just a few more weeks because we have the highly anticipated NFL schedule coming out. Uh, at the beginning of May, which is going to be great. So uh, we'll be back with more NFL coverage and stuff like that, breaking down the teams as we get into summer there. Um, But let's go ahead and start out with uh, Major League Baseball. Uh, We got some interesting storylines so far this year. Um, And Al, you know, I think there's no better way to start off than to talk about uh, Otani's translator because he's been a very naughty boy. (laughs) Yeah, um, so they released the documents um, of kind of everything that the federal government had on eBay, and um, it's a lot a lot to break down here. First of all, this dude has been taking Otani to the cleaners, and like it seems like that Otani doesn't honestly had no idea um, that this was happening to him. Mm-hmm. Uh, like to the point where like Ipe was going in and pretending he was Otani to initiate wire transfers, which <laughs> if you keep him score at home is a federal fence that is illegal. So, um, but yeah, it turns out that he like, lo- like lost like $16 million. I mean, and it was something, it was something ridiculous where he was like, he, uh, Bets total, he won like 140 million dollars and like lost 180. Like, it's it just something like bananas. Mm-hmm. Um, the things there were a couple things that I really found hilarious, uh, from what the federal government had gathered. Uh, one that he made 25,000 bets, he was making up to like 25 a day, 25 bets a day, and these bets ranged. He made one bet of ten dollars. And then, like, upwards of, like, a million dollars or something. And it, my question is, is what bet did he make for $10? And why, and, like, did he win that bet? I would like to assume no. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it's wild. Um, it doesn't seem like it's really affecting Otani too much right now. He's still starting out in a pretty good spot pretty good season at the plate so far the dodgers are kind of rolling yeah um yeah so it doesn't seem like it's really going to affect him much but like there is going to be more to this story obviously and yeah yeah i uh i i don't know exactly what kind of impact it could have it might be too early to tell but 
just a, a bad news thing all the way around for Major League Baseball, for Otani. You know, he should just be, you know, out there enjoying the sunshine, enjoying the Dodgers and them being able to be there free of distractions. But kind of difficult yeah. to be able to start the season with that. But like you said, uh, it appears it's starting pretty well for both of them. So um, wh- one thing I was going to ask you is uh, you made some preseason picks before. I just wanted to know, are are you still holding true to those or are we ch- switching up or? Uh, no, because. I mean, Baltimore's kind of doing their thing. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they just call up Jackson Holiday, who, like, who's kind of struggled at the plate, but, like, that dude's going to figure it out. Um, and he will. Baltimore has such a deep farm system of guys they can just keep calling up. Um, and their lineup's really good. I, I just watched them uh, sweep a series against the Red Sox this past weekend where they, uh, they are a, a surprisingly young team that doesn't get rattled. Like, usually you see young teams and they get rattled when, like, when shit hits the fan. But this wasn't them. They came back twice uh, in late innings against the Red Sox and pulled out wins. Now, part of that is, um, as a Red Sox fan, we have a dumpster fire of a bullpen. (laughs) We'll start there. But, But, two, like, they just, they have such a deep lineup. They just, they just keep throwing guys at you and they eventually wear you down. Yeah. Um, and with Atlanta, um, I I still think they're going to be okay. They still have a really good lineup. They still have a, a ton of depth pitching wise. I think they're going to be okay. Yeah, I know sh- losing Strider hurts. Uh, that really hurts. But like, what are you going to do? You know, uh, it's a next man up scenario, and they have enough pitching. They'll be okay. Yeah, you know what's funny, and I, I thought about this a little bit this weekend because it seems like every team that I've grown to become a fan of and loved, like whether it was the Colts, the Braves, uh, they always had that like next man up mentality, right? Like, okay, guys are going to get injured, guys are going to get hurt, guys are going to leave, next guy's got to fill up. Like the the show still goes on, you know. And I realize that's the case with every team, right? There's guys that are going to get injured. Another person's going to get an opportunity because of that. You look at the you know story of Tom Brady that never would have came to light if not for an injury. Uh, but you know, I, I look at stuff like that. Geez, my dad's rolling in his chair just hearing me say that. But <laughs> it's, yeah. but but you know, it's just uh, it, it's true. Like it, and even same same thing when we were in wrestling in high school. People get hurt. Next guy's got to fill in, right? Like you, you're not yep. going to just give up. You got to figure it out. So, um, you know, it, it hurts with Spencer Strider just because of how much he means to that team. Uh, that team really rallies around him. They really like him a lot. Uh, not to mention, like, it helps that he's a, a great player, too. Uh, that obviously helps a lot. But, you know, I, I think they're going to figure it out. And that's what happens when you got a great GM and a great head coach that has put together an excellent team. You have depth on that team. It's not just yeah. one guy. Um, and that's kind of what Alex had, had uh, alluded to was, you know, it's not the NBA with just one guy. Uh, you got to have 40, right? You know, like you've got to have guys that you can call up that are going to perform. And if, if they don't, then you're not going to get back to where you need to. Um, and in Atlanta too, they're already 10 and five to start the season. They're already like, they, they know how to win. They do. Yeah. That has been here before they are yeah. experienced. They know how to win. Like, I, I will this come back and haunt them in the postseason? Maybe. Yeah. But like for the regular season, they're gonna be fine. And this is the I, thing. I'm not really worried. Their hitting is still going to be good. Like I, I know, like I was talking to a buddy about it, and like he's like, Oh, none of their guys are leading in any categories right now. It's like, D- dude, they're 15 games into the season. Relax. Yeah. Like it takes some time. He's like, Well, for calls, the only guy I see on ESPN, and I'm like, you ESPN junkie, right? Like, come on, right. dude, you got to watch the games. You got to see what happens, right? Like, there's there's guys in the lower part of that lineup that are producing for them uh, that, that are helping them win games, and that's a, that's a big deal. But uh, yeah. I, before we move on from from the the Spencer Strider thing, and that's enough on the Braves for now, uh, j- just the, the pitching injuries, because I, I've seen this kind of become – almost a recurring theme. There's been a lot of pitchers that have been hurt. And at the, you know, like I said, we're 15 games into the season, but um, do you see the injuries as a direct correlation to the pitch clock? I want to, I want to make this very clear. I, I, 
I've, I've watched the pitch clock for a while in the minors. As somebody that goes to a lot of minor league baseball games, the pitch clock has been been around for quite a few years now. Um, I I think that it's just a coincidence. Um, I, I think that it, that it doesn't really have much to – it has less to do with that and more with the fact that major league teams are just looking for dudes who can throw 99 and a fastball like that's that's all they want pitchers to throw these days and like you you see this where like a guy that's throwing 93 but has exceptional control will get sent down over a guy that's throwing 99 and can just throw heat man loses his arm in a year you know it's yeah and that's and that's what's happening is like their guys are just throwing harder and harder and like what i remember growing you and you and I growing up the Tigers had a guy I think it was like Joel Zamaya or something and he was the first guy that I ever remember throwing over a hundred and being like whoa we're never gonna see that again yeah didn't he hit like 106 I think I'm wrong about that but like I remember it was it was like something outrageous like 106 107 yeah and then like there was Chapman and then I was like oh again we're not gonna and then it just it's so common now that like even Otani throws a hundred and you're like, I, this can't be good for people's shoulders. Yeah. You just can't like, or the elbows or any of that throwing motion, especially when you're yanking on that. Like it's, I mean, they make it look easy. Right. But it's, yeah, man, it's, I don't know. And it's amazing too. And I, I told you I was done with the Braves, but it brings me back to like looking at a guy like Maddox, right? Because like he never threw, I don't even think if he tried, he could throw 90. But yeah, like he he threw heat for a while, but like Maddox also knew how to paint the corners. Yeah, and he Maddox had that change up that like respectfully you could you could know that was coming every pitch, mm-hmm. and you weren't gonna hit it. Yeah, like it just I, I remember being frustrated, and I, I we had talked about this in an earlier episode, I think when we started last year about like going to school and friends that I had, they were like Roger Clemens fans or Pedro fans or Randy Johnson fans. They're getting all these yeah. strikeouts. Maddox isn't getting the strikeouts. They're like, oh, your guy can't even throw like over eighty five miles an hour. And I remember he hit eighty six one time, and I was so proud. I was like, yeah. yeah. But, like, really, seriously, like, he was, like, in that range of, like, 82, 83, 84, and still getting it done, right? Like, it was just yeah. forcing people into, like, hitting ground balls, and, like, he was an excellent fielder, too. But you don't see a lot of that now. Now it's, like, you need to be able to blow it by this guy, or we're not going to win, or you're not going to play. Huh? And I think, too, like, that's why I think going forward, you're not going to – like, guys like Maddox – are a thing of the past guys that can pitch 20 seasons plus like what Verlander's doing and like is wild yeah. at this point. Um, and he's like, already had Tommy John w- once or twice. Twice. Dude. And he's still yeah. going out there. Like I, I just, yeah. it's unbelievable, man. But you're, you're just not going to see guys with that longevity anymore. And I, which means like, I don't think you're going to see another 300 game winner and, in our lifetime, like I don't, a 300 uh, career game, a 300 game career winner. Like, yeah. you're not, that's yeah. just not something that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, you know, I, and that's, that's sad. That really is because that requires a, a longevity that just with guys throwing the way they're throwing, it, it's just not humanly possible to keep doing. Like, it's not. Yeah. Meanwhile, hitters are just getting better, right? Like, it's, they're able to yeah. hit more home runs, more power, all of that. So I, I just, I don't know. It's, it's sad the way that pitching has changed. And I know they're basically looking for something to point the finger at to say this is the reason. But I'm glad you brought that up because it can't be good throwing that, that hard for that long for that many years, right? Yeah. Like, I just had this pulled up because I, I was just curious with myself, mm-hmm. like, what that looks like. Justin Verlander, your your active career leader in wins. Mm-hmm. He's pitched for 18 seasons and has 257 wins. Oh Scherzer, God. 16. Kershaw for 16. He has 210. And then it's Garrett Cole with 11 seasons. And he's 33 years old. He has 145 career wins. Yeah. He's not even halfway there. Yeah, and then it's... it's... Uh... Yeah, it's just like... It's guys like Aaron Nola. He's 10 years in and has 92 career wins. Which is really good because he's a good pitcher. But 
you're yeah, you're right. No, it's just that, yeah, that is really good. But like, so we're getting into the good for this time period mm-hmm. now. Yeah. And then yeah. let's be thankful for the guys that we were able to see. Like, I don't know. My dad still brings it up constantly about Sandy Koufax going out and pitching a doubleheader. Like yeah. both game, both games, complete games, doubleheader, and like, you know. Wasn't sitting there with his arm. Yeah. Ten years. Like. Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy too. Like some of the stuff, like some of the old guys that were able to do. uh, I don't know. It just again, it's different. Each each genre, and I say that like because it's the old, the the current, the the you know contemporary, all of them, right? Like all of these pitchers come from a different time, and like they all have things that made them great during their time. So. Yeah. I don't know, man. It'd be interesting to see like when they do case studies on this, how it ends up coming out. Um, but I think it's going to point in the direction you're talking about. Yeah. I, I think going forward, I think we have to like re-examine like what looks like a good career and a Hall of Fame career for a pitcher. Like I think if a pitcher can get to 200 career wins at this point, like that's that's an impressive career. Very impressive. Is- and like now, like instead of pitching complete games, which does not, is not allowed anymore, basically. Um, no. Now you have more like combined no hitters, combined shutouts, combined, you know, perfect games, stuff like that. Right. Like rather than just one individual doing it, it takes multiple guys and it's more beneficial for a team to let a guy pitch four and a half innings and let another one come in and pitch two and then one and then a third, yeah. right? Like, it's just, it's, it's more difficult for hitters to do like to, to go up against that. Right. When you're going yeah. up against fresh arms that are throwing that heat, it's tough. So, yeah. um, yeah, very interesting. I, it's something I want to come back to, like, as we get further into the season, because I'm curious as to like how many more are going to come up. Is this the end of it uh, for, you know, a couple months or, you know, what ends up creeping up next? But right. anything else you wanted to cover for, for baseball at all? Um, No, just um, it's nice seeing teams that you wouldn't normally see that are good. Um, I, I remember, ta- although I, I will... It's early, but I want to take a quick victory lap on saying that the Royals would be decent this year. Yeah, um, the Royals that had a lot of uh, a lot of signings in the off season that were like, "Hey, these all seem like sneaky, low key, decent signings that'll make them competitive." And right now, they're they're playing pretty well. Um, yeah. um, also, watching Houston be absolutely dog shit terrible uh, is kind of fun. Um, I watched, I watched them against your Braves last night, actually. Uh, it was 2 1 in the eighth, and uh, they had two on, two out, bottom of the eighth. Jordan Alvarez comes up, and you're like, Welp, this is gonna, this is gonna end poorly for Atlanta. And Jordan Alva, Alvarez had a, a pop up in the infield, yeah. and you're like, Boy. Um, Atlanta yeah, got but, away uh, with it, one there. <laughs> it, it better things right now. Jose Altuve is hitting almost 400. Yeah, he's uh, he's, he's been a, a bright spot in a very dark crater on that team. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. No, it's early. Um. Yeah, it's it's good though. Like it's. It, I'm glad the season's back. I'm glad I have baseball to watch or listen to. It's, it's always a good time, mm-hmm. even if my team is dog shit well technically so. if both of our teams end up being bad we can just like the dodgers because we have players that from our teams that play for the dodgers so sure. <laughs> it's yeah. i mean yeah, no, the red sox currently lead the league in categories that aren't good to lead in uh they lead the league in errors <laughs> which is great that's that's good, a good start that is good fundamental baseball sure is sure is i watched the other night um against Baltimore they uh they could have gotten out of a uh, inning with an inning ending, inning ending double play mm-hmm. the guy on second forgot to tag second um okay and then if you're wondering what happened next the next guy came up and then hit a hit a two-run homer okay so, yeah that's yeah. usually when it rains it pours right yeah no it's 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 a lot of that this season with the Red Sox so it's, <laughs> it's fine it's fine Everything is fine. Well, if it makes you feel any better and gives you any sort of solace, I'm pretty sure that the only the only solace you're going to find in Boston right now is with the Bruins and the Celtics. But the Celtics are going to fall short in the playoffs again. 
Just want to let How you know you? that um, it's going to happen. Um, probably. Yeah. Probably. But, uh, but the you? Bruins, I mean, they're, uh, they're very good. Uh, they're very yeah, tough. The Bruins were also very good last year, as in like historically good. And they didn't get out of the first round. So. Yeah. It, I mean, who knows? They ran into a buzzsaw on the way. So it's, yeah. uh, but anyhow, uh, we, we need to take a little sidebar there. Right. But, um, Speaking of another team that's going to make you feel really good this year, uh, uh, let's talk about the NFL. <laughs> some, some draft coverage, oh, right? Yeah. So before we get into your, uh, you know what, let's start with it, right? Any clarity on your Patriots at all, what they're going to do? So they did bring in Jaden Daniels and Drake May for visits. Mm-hmm. I've got to think that they're going to take one of them. And Jaden right. Daniels said... He wants to go and play for the Patriots, but uh, that was after he had a bad visit with Washington. But I almost think that like Washington has to patch that up and figure that out because um, he's yeah. a good player. Um, he's a good player. Very good. <sighs> I like him more than I like Drake May. Um, Yeah. The problem with Jaden Daniels is though, like, that dude's 200 pounds. Yeah, like, you can put on size. He can. But how much, though, can he put on before he's not effective? Like, that dude's going to take a lot of, that dude's going to take some hits. And, like, uh, I, I don't know, man. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to call you out, but you were a fan of Bryce Young. I was. I was. I mean, that dude had, that dude had pedigree. And I was like, yeah. oh, man. Like, and I still, I'm still thinking that he could be a good quarterback. I just, I think he doesn't have anything around him. Um, well, yeah, he got put into a really shitty situation. Yeah, he here, doesn't. Not going to get better. I hate to say this, but I feel like he is an owner that doesn't care. And that's really tough yeah. to overcome that. Um, yeah. But let's let's talk about a few teams uh, while we cover some draft coverage here. Because uh, there's a few teams in the first round that have two picks. And anytime you i mean anytime you got one pick it's great but when you got two in the first round you got some decisions to be made and like chicago starts up top right because they get the pick from carolina they got the first pick in the draft and i mean i i think at this point like i'd probably be shocked if they didn't take caleb williams i feel like they're they're going to um unless unless something crazy happens right like all the experts are saying it mel kuyper field yates all these guys are saying that like He's going there. So I just, my question for you is have the bears put enough pieces around him to make him successful? And before you answer, think about this. They signed Deandre Swift in the off season at running back yeah. who notoriously has been an injury concern, but last year he stayed healthy in Philly in a timeshare, right? Yeah. At running back. Uh, well, Keenan wasn't a full time back, but yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah Keenan Allen, um, who who gets hurt, he does, but me. he also had one of the best seasons of his career last year, right? And yeah. he's kind of in a prove it mode now, where he's like, "How dare the Chargers trade me away? They think I'm worth nothing," and they yeah. were kind of dis they kind of disrespected him on the on the way out the door. Um, so he's he's still he's a baller, man. He can ball. They got DJ Moore there. They bring in Gerald Everett from LA as well at tight end, who he's not yeah. much of a blocker, but he's a big bodied guy that can catch the ball. Um, and they also bring Coleman Shelton at center from the Rams, which is, you know, that anytime you get a starting center, that's going to give someone a little bit, of, a little bit to go off of. Now, mind you, the bears made some moves on the line last year, right? Like they drafted a few guys, they brought in a few guys through free agency. So they're not, terrible but do you think they've put enough around for Caleb Williams to go in there and be successful I think that he's walking into a better situation than what Justin Fields had I'll start absolutely there. absolutely um, yeah <clears throat> there just is this history though with Chicago Bears quarterbacks man like something happens when they get to Chicago like I like, Rex I Grossman really, went to a Super Bowl. <laughs> you're not wrong. You're Look, not wrong. it's in that picture right there. I, Up there, I that picture right there, right? He threw a pick to I, Bob Sanders. We know it. 
that's a Super Bowl that I, I I still think about that the Patriots should have won because we should, never should have blown that game to Indianapolis in the AFC title game. Well, I digress, but how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think Caleb Williams is he's going into a decent situation. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't necessarily trust the coaching. Um, because they had Justin Fields last year, and respectfully, they drew up some of the worst plays for him. Yeah, I just... Like I said before, they getting him out of there, because Ryan Poles said as the GM, like, listen, we're going to do right by Justin, like, make sure it happens. I, as I said before, it's a, it was a master class on how to lose the locker room. And I think it's going to be a matter of time. Maybe these guys rally around Caleb Williams and they never think about Justin Fields again. But I guarantee there's guys in that locker room that are pissed off about the way things were handled with Justin. And I guarantee yeah. there's a lot of people in that fan base. Now, winning does a lot to cull those those feelings, right? So yeah. if Caleb Williams comes in and starts winning games, like things are going to change. But... And I mean, they talk about him as a generational talent. You know, that's what they say about him. That they his his prototype in the NFL. They say his comparison, uh, his doppelganger is Patrick Mahomes. So they they think that he plays the game like Patrick Mahomes does. Now Patrick Mahomes has heavier hands because he's got a few rings on those. Um, sure, but um that's who they've compared him to i think with their second pick they need to come back and like there's been rumors of them coming and grabbing this uh this wide receiver from washington odunze i think his yeah. name is and he is i mean he's fantastic to watch he really is um honestly like i i agree with you i think that the bears this is a really deep wide receiver class yep like incredibly deep. They need to grab one of those guys. Yeah, they do. Um, and, and if I were them, maybe you try trading up. I mean, I, they're currently at nine. Maybe you try to trade up and now, like do trade you trade up to like three or like, yeah. Do you think they do what the Texans did last year? Is that like, because here's the thing, man, like, I don't think you have to get to three. I think we know quarterbacks are going to go in the top three. Because there's even Arizona's, Arizona's not giving up four because they're going to no. take Marvin Harrison at four. If yeah. they're if, if they're still at four, that's why they have to trade up to three. Yeah, they have to. And the Bears only have four picks this year, so they'd have to give up future capital to be able to to get up to four and make it compelling, yeah. right? Yeah, I think I think Harrison goes at four. Is there any way you think neighbors Malik Neighbors from LSU ends up slipping to them at nine? Because I think the Giants are going to go after him. They need a number one guy. He's been linked to them. He's that guy. But I don't know, man. Quarterback as well, though. But they, I, they might. They, I feel like they have to run it back with Danny Dimes because of the money they're paying him. Yeah, I mean, they brought in Drew Locke, but they're going to draft a guy. Maybe they go after Bo Nix or someone like that later. Um, Yeah, or Michael Phoenix. Penix? I could see him going to five at the Chargers, though, because the Chargers need a receiver. Because, you know, they traded theirs away for a bag of peanuts. Yeah, but, and this is the thing, like, I've heard that before, but I see, and, like, this is just my perception of John Harbaugh. He is boring. He's going to end up picking the uh, Joe Alt from Notre Dame. And Nor- Joe but- Alt is, the, the, in my opinion, the clear best tackle in the draft. But tackle's a boring pick. A boring pick. The Chargers need a ridiculously good receiver. Quentin Johnston is not that guy. We saw it last year. Uh, unless he was like, you know, doing the rope a dope last year. But you know what's you know what's boring? Watching a Chargers game and watching Easton Stick be a quarterback because yeah, the line you're right. couldn't block for Herbert. Yeah. Like, respectfully. Yeah, that is uh dude, there's even rumors of them possibly trading Herbert. To New England, I, could you imagine? Don't tease me like that. Yeah, Do not tease me. Like yeah, that. I, I, I just don't. I saw you got half would, a chub there. <laughs> it's I would, more than half. It hit the table. <laughs> Man, um, I would sell my soul for that to happen. Yeah, I really like Justin Herbert a lot. Please get him out of that situation. But he he's a Cal. He looks like a California boy, right? He deserves yeah. to be there. He just needs a coach and needs a an organization that's going to put 
weapons around him and be able to keep him upright, right? Because if he's able to do that, if you give him a running game, that guy is going to absolutely crush it. But yeah. all right. So I know we got a little off track there because we were talking about Chicago and the possible trades that could happen. We mentioned about a little bit of Arizona because they're the second team, right? That has two picks in the first round. Um, you know, they're obviously they're linked to Harrison Jr. Who's just another generational talent. Like his dad, obviously a great Colt, longtime Colt. His son, quite a bit bigger than him. Uh, and and a, a different receiver, I think, than than his dad is. But has a lot of the same traits that were passed down genetically, <laughs> right? Um, but do you see them going after, uh, like, do you see them going after a QB with their second pick? Or do you see them snagging a lineman in the bottom of the first round? Like, what, what do you think for that? I think they're going to run it back with Kyler. I think they are because yeah. I think they're too invested in him. Um, I don't think he's bad. Like, talk about another guy that's small, right? Kyler's small, man. But that yeah. dude that dude can make plays. When he's healthy, oh my goodness, is he a playmaker. Is he going to study his playbook, though? Like, uh, It depends. Play? So what they did is they have an o- a-, a Call of Duty overlay uh, yeah. that they yeah. put on the playbook, and, and he just runs through it that way, right? All, now, all, I, the plays in the, all the plays in the playbook are just Call of Duty maps. All, all jokes aside, man, yeah. it, like... He did screw around, right? And like everyone knows that they dog him for it, but that guy does stuff on the field that I could never dream of doing. Um, have never done, will never do, right? Like, and he's gonna see himself become into the relevant quarterback conversation again. He's gonna be a top ten quarterback again, I believe. Um this year. So yeah. We will see, but maybe they go lineman at the end. I don't know. I mean, the the last team that that had two picks was Minnesota. Man, they came in. Uh, I mean, they've already been linked to JJ McCarthy, right? So, um, and I think that's kind of like a foregone conclusion that they're going to trade up to three. I don't know if it's exactly going to happen, but can we, can um, we go back to Arizona real quick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if we're going to do the, you know how we talked about the Bears trying to trade up? Yeah. Arizona has a lot more draft capital. They could afford to trade up because they're currently picking at 27 as well. Cause they got that pick from Houston for, for the will, for the Will Anderson pick. Yep. I like, if somebody's going to go after like a Joe Alt lineman, Arizona could do it. They have the capital, man. Yeah. Like, and I, I think they definitely need a tackle as well. They, they snagged one, I think last year in the first round, but they're, they're going to need somebody else. Um, yeah. Yeah. And plus, Joe Alt, I'm fairly certain, too, has played multiple positions in college. He sure has. Uh, so, um, be real nice to add a guy like that to your line. And, and like, you kind of saw this with Detroit. Like, Detroit, like, the last couple drafts, really, like, <clears throat> they made the boring picks. Mm-hmm. They drafted linemen, and, like, look at them now. They won 14 games last year. So, yeah, like, it's uh, I'm I'm so glad you mentioned them too because they're like what they've been doing and it, it hasn't just been last year like the year before they did it as well but like it wasn't as noticeable because they needed some of those star pieces that they picked up last year they really did yeah. um but I, I don't know like uh, Minnesota's one that that scares me right because like they have Sam Darnold obviously they're linked to JJ McCarthy they want to bring him in. And if it were me, I'd sit him behind Sam Darnold for at least a couple weeks. Listen, you got to, man. Like, he's going to get killed what, out there. What is he going to learn from Sam Darnold, respectfully? Like, <laughs> uh, So, like, and this is the thing. I don't really know Sam Darnold that well. And most of most of the times, his, his advanced metrics are very, very low. I think he's, like, 38 out of, like, 41 quarterbacks that have started 60 games in the NFL. Um, yeah. So it's uh I don't think it's 60 games. 40 games something like that. But it's enough that like his metrics are not that good. I don't think he's ever been on a team where he's had the weapons that he has now. Think about it. The Jets, they sucked. They did not put any weapons around him. Carolina was god awful, right? Like okay, so he had DJ Moore there, but if you don't get protection, which the line was awful when he was there, what are you going to do? 
he gets traded to San Francisco or signs with San Francisco in the offseason, right? I can't remember how that went down, but he ends up there, never going to see the the time of day with Brock Purdy there, but has a chance to really like play with good weapons. Could you imagine it's like going over to your friend's house and they let you drive their dad's Ferrari? And it's like, yeah. oh, yeah, why don't you take the Porsche? Oh, take the Lambo now. Like, oh, throw into Christian McCaffrey. Like, oh, this feels so good, right? Like, right. I, I'm, I'm going to say a thing. I, I, I don't think J.J. McCarthy is a good quarterback. I, okay. I just think there are better quarterbacks out there. I think J.J. McCarthy, like, a lot of his success was based on the insane defense that was at Michigan. There's and a just ton of hype. Win. There's yeah. a ton like, of hype around him because of that Ohio State game where, like, he was very good. And yeah. uh, I just – I don't know. Uh, the rest of these guys, like, you look at Caleb Williams' numbers, ridiculous, man. Ridiculous in college. JJ McCarthy, it wasn't, he wasn't the dude, right? Like that's, yeah. that's the guy I want running my team is the dude, right? I don't want a guy that might be able to do it or maybe could given the opportunity. No, I want the guy that is the dude that knows it's his job, right? Like, yeah. I, I don't know the rest of these guys. I feel that way about all the way down through like Bo Nix and Michael Penix, right? Like uh, they, you can tell like, okay, maybe they make mistakes. That's fine. They're still good quarterbacks, right? Like, and it's unquestioned what they like, how good they are. Right. Maybe they're not Caleb Williams, Drake may Jaden Daniels, that level, but I still think they're great quarterbacks. They didn't play on a team with the, the talent level that Washington has. Um, I'm sorry that, that Michigan has right. Washington yeah. and Oregon did not have the talent that Michigan had this year. In fact, yeah. very few teams in the country had the talent that Michigan had. And we're going to find I mean, that out. Michigan defensively, Mich Michigan defensively this year was just, they just punched everybody in the mouth. You're going to, you, you'll find it out in another week, man. Another week. Yeah. Just wait and see. Cause uh, yeah. all these guys are going to get drafted and you're going to be like, Holy cow. Was that really 14, 15 guys from Michigan that got drafted? Yep. Yeah. I don't think JJ McCarthy's the best one. Th that's the problem too. Yeah. Right? Like that's, that's the other issue, but I, I don't know. I, I hope Minnesota gets it figured out because if they don't, they need to figure out something about Justin Jefferson. Like that, that contract BS has been going on for way too long with him. Sign that guy to a monster deal, pay him what he deserves or trade him. Yeah. And if you do trade him, you should be getting two first rounders for that. That's the oh, one of the guys in the league that I look at that. I'm like, he's worth two first rounders. This is a very important draft for Minnesota mm -hmm. because they're kind of at a crossroads. Yeah. Detroit's a really good team. Green Bay kind of seemingly has found their next quarterback again. So they're going to contend this year. The Bears, I think, are going to be frisky. Like, And the Vikings have all the weapons. They just need a quarterback. And if they don't figure this out in this draft, this is really going to set them back. Yeah, I mean, TJ Hawkinson's still nursing that ACL. He may not be back till late, but you're right, man. Like, I feel like the way that situation was handled, and I know they've got a good GM. I get that, man. I know they've got a good coach. I get that, too. My issue is it feels like you were out on the town flirting with some girls, and then you came home, and then all of a sudden you're mad because Kirk left. Like, you should have yeah. paid him, right? Like, pay that dude. And, and and respectfully too, you you can't have Sam, Sam Darnold throwing passes. You no, cannot, respectfully, you cannot have that. I know you weren't a I know you weren't a Cousins fan. I get that, but like it Cousins looks was better than any, yeah. It than looks much worse now for Minnesota than it did when he when he was there. I yeah. do not like their chances at all in this division. I have them finishing fourth. I would like to see who they get at quarterback first. Yeah. Because I, I think that really depends. Because if they can get somebody good, I could see them challenging for this division. It could change. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Um, Just real quick. I know uh, just looking at some of these picks, right? Arizona, Philly, Green Bay, Washington, they all have at least three picks in the top 64 in the top uh, two rounds, which is a big deal. 
Um, for because you look at Green Bay, they're on they're on the rise, right? Philly, they've reloaded. They've added some serious talent, not only to that defense. They bring back C.J. Gardner Johnson, Devin White. Um, they added Saquon on offense. They're reloading yeah. and they are trying to push for a Super Bowl now. Not, I mean, Tomlinson. Uh, uh not Tomlinson. Uh. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh the, um Lane Lane uh I'm Lane trying Johnson. to Lane Johnson, yes. He's what 34 now? Like he's getting up there in age. He doesn't have too many years left. Uh they just inked my lotta to a huge contract, which I don't know. If you if you want to have a fun time, watch a video of him playing rugby. Yeah. Um running yeah. running the ball at six eight. 320 pounds a monster yeah. um yeah with, with that guy's pulling i i if that were me i would just i would i would play the olay and just let him i'd get out of the yeah, way yeah so that's just not oops. worth it oops i fell um yeah but yeah. yeah so philly's reloading green bay is on the rise i definitely think arizona they're still a ways away but they're going to add some serious talent they have a chance to add some serious talent in this draft um and washington as well like with Dan Quinn taking over there uh, again, like it's been 20 years of crap for Washington, right? Like they haven't been good. They've been yeah. all right. Some years. Okay. Tyler Heineke, like uh, we remember that in the, in the playoffs and stuff, but they haven't been good. Right. So now they have an opportunity to, to really add some talent under Dan Quinn. They bring in Bobby Wagner on the defensive side, right? Like yeah. I, I don't think they made some bad moves. Terry McLaurin and Jahan Dotson. They're good players, man. They bring Zach Ertz in at tight end. Like, they need a quarterback there. I, I really think that they got rid of Sam Howell. If they bring in Jaden Daniels, he's got some playmakers around him to try to work with, right? But yeah. they need to add some more talent to that roster. It's no longer okay to just have one good receiver or two good receivers. Now you need three, right? People are copying the blueprint of what the Bengals did, having those three legit receivers. You got to have that, right? Have to. Um, yeah. Uh, we had kind of already talked about like teams that we thought might trade up and stuff, but uh, w one question, and this was kind of an intriguing one. And if you don't know, I can go first, but who, who's your favorite player in this year's draft? Like your most intriguing prospect. Give me a minute to think about this because there's a couple ways I, I, I kind of want to, I could go with this and I, I, I'm, I, I just I think I need a minute on that. Okay. Well, I'm going to I'm going to hammer mine home because yeah. this this has been like coming for an entire year that I've been waiting to talk about this guy. Um out of Iowa, Cooper De Dejan, I think his name is. Dude, this yeah. guy. First of all, I got to love Iowa boys, right? Bob Sanders, he was an absolute stud, the band hammer, right? Um but this this guy just Cooper plays the game like a veteran. He really yeah. does, man. The way he sees the field, the way he runs with the ball in his hands, right? Like being a defensive back and being white is not common in football nowadays. He's giving yeah. guys that sit in recliners and on their couch like me hope, um, even though there is none, right? But he's super versatile. And bro, like he runs punts too. Like yeah. this, this guy, not only is he effective when he has the ball, like he scores touchdowns. He reminds me, and I I hate to make this comparison, but like I get that same fear watching him play that I got when I watched Ed Reed with the ball in his hands. Now, I don't think he's Ed Reed at all, but when I see him run with the ball, I'm like, oh, dude, this guy's going to score right here. Like, it's it's wild, man. Like, I just, I just think wherever he lands, he's going to be an absolute instant upgrade for that team. And I think he's going to be a day one starter, no matter what team he goes to. Yeah. That's my I, I boy. Think for me, mm -hmm. I, I think for me, and I know this feels like the safe pick, but like watching Marvin Harrison Jr. in college for two years, first of all, the it very rarely happens where your your dad is an NFL, like an NFL all time great. Yeah. And then you're somehow better than he is. Yeah. That that very rarely happens because like th those expectations are put on you and you've got to have some goddamn big shoulders for that. Yeah. And in 
in his three years at Ohio State, he had 31 receiving touchdowns. Like, yeah, that's that's a lot. 2,500 yards, like 140 catches. Like he, even on, and the thing is, is like games, there was a game he had last year, and I want to say it was against Rutgers. It was like he had, it was towards the end of the season. He had four catches for 25 yards. And you're wondering, boy, that's a shitty game. He still had two touchdowns. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, that's the thing. He's the guy that can burn you with speed, but he's also the guy that you're like, okay, like Randy Moss, like you just throw him a jump ball in the end zone and he's going to go get it. Like, yeah, he's, I think he's, like, it, it, I, I'm glad you mentioned that about like how difficult it is to live up to those expectations. Like Chris Jenkins is another guy, like his dad was a beast in the NFL and he's at Michigan and I don't think he's what his dad was, but he's going to be yeah. good in the NFL and he could blossom into a, a, a great defensive tackle. Uh, but his dad was ferocious. Like yeah. he was scary. Same thing with Marvin Harrison. You're starting to see a lot of those guys that played. Now their kids are coming through. Uh, Ryan yeah. Clark's another one who's on ESPN. His son's going to likely get drafted at some point. Um, I don't think this year he'll, he'll probably be coming out next year after he, um, he went, he, f- he did a few years at Arizona state. Now he's at Notre Dame. Uh, for another year so um but yeah man you're seeing these guys come through and it's big shoes to fill man and i you know hats off to them i I wasn't able to fill them but some people are i just hope that with marvin harrison jr he gets put in the right situation yeah like like you think about dudes like jamar chase like that dude got put in the right situation because he had a quarterback in Joe Burrow and it it, it helped that they were college teammates. Yeah. He he knew, he knew like, and it's even crazier when you think that Joe Burrow also had Justin Jefferson on that team in college. Like no wonder he won a national title and threw for 6,700 yards. Yeah. Like that tracks. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, they, they got a good team. So, it's uh it's interesting to see that but uh let's um before we wrap up here i just wanted to to cover just one last thing about nfl free agency because i think it's a big deal and we we, we've been away for a few weeks we didn't really get to talk about it uh but stefan diggs getting traded to the texans um i just my main question i think this might be the only one i have to ask you did you realize that the steelers the pittsburgh steelers they got more in a trade for chase claypool than the Bills did for Stefan Diggs. Yeah. Yeah, I I think this <laughs> I think it's pretty damning that like A, the Bills are gonna eat a bunch of the dead cap money this year to get it just so they can get rid of Diggs. Yeah. Like I think that this was a very much like a we're tired of your shit. Um, we think that you're on the downside of your career, even though he had a pretty good season last year. Like he just felt like every other game, if he didn't get the ball, like he was just kind of running his mouth. Um, and I, I think the bills were like, you know what? We've had enough, um, which is wild because now like, I don't know who Josh Allen's thrown to, which we'll talk about in a future episode, but this does excite me for the Texans. Yeah. Because this now if Diggs can just kind of put his head down this year and like kind of not talk to the media and like, just kind of go in there and like help CJ Stroud out, the Texans have a, have a shot to actually contend this year. Yeah. I think they've put themselves in really good position to be able to contend this year. Um, They did lose a few pieces on defense. They reloaded a little bit, Um, but I really, I like the vibe that's coming out of Houston and, and Ryan, like Dimico Ryan's is still saying like, Hey guys, like we, it doesn't matter who we add. We still got to go out and win games. Um, He's got the right mindset, man. He really does. Yeah. I, and I think too, like, I don't like, this is just, they're just essentially renting him for a year and I don't think they're going to resign him. No, they didn't no. have to give up a ton for it. It's, yeah. it's kind of a win-win situation for them. And they're not eating much of his cat of his salary, which is even better. Like, yeah. yep, good on him, and good on the Texans. Like, this is a my fear though is like the culture that Ryan's has built in Houston. A guy like Diggs can kind of break, tear that down. I don't. And that's my fear. My hope is that the foundation's strong enough that he doesn't have that effect. Um, I agree. 
But I hope so too. But yeah, CJ Stroud, like I, I don't know, man. Like I I don't he hasn't been in the league as long as Josh Allen. I don't know if he's got that thick skin, right? Um yeah. where he's gonna yell back at at Diggs, right? I don't know. We're going to have to kind of see. It's going to be an experiment. Maybe he goes there and he's completely happy and it doesn't matter because he's making good money and he doesn't care. And as long as they're winning, they don't care. But like, I don't know. We're going to have to see, man. He's going to have a lot more opportunities there with Tank Dell there, Nico Collins. Like, I think they have some legit playmakers on that offense that are going to make things easier. But it it also remains to be seen. Let's see who they add through the draft. Let's see kind of how they, they come into place there. I think, well, I think too, like, I don't think CJ Stroud's going to yell at him, but D'Amico Ryan's will yell at him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. D'Amico Ryan's won't put up with that. Like, yeah. That's, he's, the thing. that's like, a scary man, too. Yeah. Um, he tackled a lot yeah. of people in the NFL. Um, in fact, that'd be interesting to see a case study on how many people were actually tackled, like, different people were tackled by, by him in the NFL. <laughs> also, just a friendly reminder that the Vikings essentially traded him and got Justin Jefferson. Yeah, because they traded that bill, yep. that Bills twenty twenty first round pick, yep. which became Justin Jefferson. Yeah, so which was a good a good trade at the time. Um, yeah, like the Bills weren't dumb for doing that. Uh, Justin Jefferson was a good college player, but we didn't know he was going to be JJ in the NFL, right? Like it's yeah, it's a big deal. But all right, well, um, I just brought up the last trivia question that we had uh, when we were breaking down and stuff, and that one was how many Super Bowls have USC quarterbacks won? Um, I know this was a few weeks ago, but it's a big it's fat zero. zero. Yeah. So um, that's kind of a funny, funny thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it's. Uh, I was shocked by that number because I would. I. But then, like, I started going through all the USC quarterbacks that like were good starters in the league, and I was mm-hmm. like, well, no, he never won a Super Bowl. He didn't win a Super Bowl. He didn't like, and you're just like, oh boy, this it's wild. And USC's had good quarterbacks. Like they have, man. They have. Mark right. Sanchez was a dog for eating a, a hot dog on the sideline. I love that. Honestly, I would have done the same. Yeah, I can't fault the guy I'm for that. All about eating those glizzies on the sideline, man. Yeah, I am. I'll do you it. I'll do it. Glizzy gobbler. <laughs> oh man, you got to watch that video with T Higgins giving. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, it's so it's good. <laughs> he devours it. It's so good. A glizzy gobbler. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, it was, uh, I was glad to be able to do another one with you, bro. We're going to come back. We'll have some more trivia next week that we'll, we'll dig in with you guys and stuff. We'll come back, give you some more coverage on, uh, major league baseball, the NFL, all that stuff. But, um, just happy to do another one with you, bro. And I, I really appreciate it, man. A lot of fun doing these. Yeah. yeah and, and next week, the big four, Oh, we're, uh, we're over the hill. We're over the hill with a show, you know? Yeah, yeah. We will be. I thought you were saying my age. I'm like, damn, I'm not 40 yet. No. But no, um, we're, we're, we're getting there, though. Yeah, we're yeah. We, we are getting there. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, man, I absolutely love you. Take care of yourself. Have a have a good one. And we will uh, we will see you next week. All right, Willie, I love you. Stay safe. Peace, Peace. bro.